This is the audio log of maintenance technician Adam Bernays, dated November 10th, 2145. I fixed the couplings on the heat shields this morning with no problems. I did, however, have another odd experience while I was down there. Shortly after finishing the first coupling adjustment, I distinctly heard whispering. When I went to investigate the sounds, I found nothing. I checked the work logs, and I was the only person scheduled to be in that area today. That experience, coupled with the stories I've heard from some guys over in the Delta Labs, has me pretty freaked out. I'm really beginning to hate going down to the underground maintenance area. The people down there are a bit off. The mumbling, the weird looks. The whole place is just plain creepy. I'm always expecting someone to jump out at me. I've secured my tools and the busted modulator in the storage cabinet next to the maintenance elevator. Technicians should use cabinet code 396 to access them. End of log. This is Grant Baston, the Environmental Services Supervisor. The date is October 19th. I've been hearing an alarming number of reports on some uh, unexplainable things. Being on another planet and working underground has always been a little spooky, so we always have the occasional report of strange things. But what is worrying me is the fact that the number of these reports are up by a lot. People are truly frightened. The rumors we are hearing about experiments from the Delta Complex are not helping. The power fluctuations aren't helping at all either. Having the lights flicker constantly and losing power for several minutes at a time is scaring everyone down here. I'm doing my best to keep people in track, but we're continually shorthanded. Someone's reporting in sick almost every day. I'll keep my director apprised of the situation and will continue to log reports as I get them. This is the audio log of Frank Delahue, engineering manager assigned to power production dated October 18, 2145. The current operational status of the grid is 23% over nominal capacity. I've increased work shifts to 12 hours a day for all personnel to keep up with demand. The constant and increasing load from the Delta complex is causing havoc. We are going to start losing critical systems if we have to sustain these levels much longer. I request clearance to requisition parts from other departments in order to maintain our equipment. Okay, I don't know what is going on over in Delta, but I'm doing all I can down here. The constant demands are bad enough, but the rumors going around are making things a whole lot worse. And I gotta tell you, if things don't get better soon, all hell is gonna break loose. This is the audio log of Frank Delahue, engineering manager assigned to power production, dated October 24th, 2145. Reclamation problems continue to plague the main processor. Two more valve overloads on that unit in just the past week. These overloads can destroy the valves, causing very dangerous fire jetting with enough heat to incinerate sensitive equipment nearby. Today we've had only one reported injury as a result of these valve failures, and this is due in large part to the quick response of the engineering team. Our procedure of entering the failure code 842 in the operation terminal has proved adequate, and I recommend no changes in that procedure. This is Mark Stanton, Manifest Controller, currently stationed at Mars City. I'm not sure who to send this to, so I decided to send it to quite a few people. If you're on the recipient list, please take a moment to review this report. It is quite important. I'm very concerned over the shipping procedures out here. I am the Manifest Controller, and as such, I need to be informed of everything coming in and out of Mars City. Someone here is subverting my position and preventing me from getting data on things being shipped. This is unacceptable. Not only could this reflect poorly on my upcoming review, but this is my job and I'm tired of being out of the loop. I have no idea who keeps telling the shipping crews to allow things in and out without allowing me to produce or procure the manifest, but whoever it is, it must stop. One of the dock workers actually told me to piss off when I tried to stop one of the last containers from going straight to Delta. I immediately filed a report and will follow up with the transit manager next time I see him. End of log. Audio log for Dr. Cassian, currently stationed at Mars City. I have just left the weekly status meeting here in medical. The most prominent topic was the vast number of psychological issues we are seeing as of late. The number of reports indicates that 10% of the overall base personnel have shown symptoms. As many people will not come in for this type of thing, 
the number of affected personnel could truly be in the 30 to 40 percent range. It has even manifested itself here in medical. We uh, have several nurses and a couple of good doctors out for related reasons. I'm going to formally request two additional psychiatrists on the next shuttle from Earth. The two we have are being overworked, and the content of their sessions with patients is starting to affect them as well. Dr. Casey and out. Dr. Mark Casey, at 1547, patient Jonathan Wills was admitted after complaining of insomnia and nausea. According to the nurse, Mr. Wills was calm and exhibited no signs of disorder when he was brought to exam room 5. However, by the time I reached him at 10 after 4, his personality had changed dramatically. When I entered the room, Mr. Wills lunged at me with a scalpel he apparently stole from a supply drawer. With the assistance of an orderly, we managed to subdue and sedate him without injury. Mr. Wills was heavily medicated and could not be diagnosed, but in the 20 minutes he was left unattended, he managed to carve three symbols in his arm and cut his own tongue into two halves. I, I can only guess at the cause of his problems. I hope that additional psychiatrists arrive soon. In the meantime, in response to this assault, all medical supplies and armaments will be locked in a secure hospital cabinet with the code 347. Dr. Casey and out. Audio report on troop morale. Morale here is beginning to drop. It's nothing to worry about yet since I keep my Marines sharp and ready to go, but events at the base are wearing on the troops. There have been a lot of things happening here on the base. I believe the UAC experiments being performed here must be the cause. Out here, they could be experimenting on God knows what. There are quite a few people missing, and no Marines of course. It's the civilian population I am referring to. Bottom line, whatever it is they have going on here has my men on a razor's edge. At this point, there is no cause for alarm, but I am requesting we rotate squads every 90 days instead of every 180. I will continue to report as the situation develops. It is good we have the new Marines en route. Fresh faces will help. Sergeant Tyson, out. Audio report confirming new troop deployments for the Mars City Marine Facility, October 30th, 2145. The new troops will be arriving within a few days. I've started a series of training exercises focusing on close quarter small weapons combat, as well as instituting mandatory refresher courses on all munitions and weapons in our armory. In response to the large number of security breaches and general feelings of ill will around the base, I've doubled security details, placing two Marines at each checkpoint. This additional presence should help calm things down. I expect that the incoming Marines are not quite as green as the last deployment. They've turned out okay, but some combat experience will go a long way right now. Sergeant Tyson, out. This is the audio log of Director William Banks, dated October 20th, 2145. It has come to my attention that we have an alarming number of missing personnel throughout the base. My office has received four additional reports from Delta in the last week alone, mentioning that personnel are not reporting for work and that calls to their quarters have gone unanswered. My office has sent the names of those personnel to Mars City Security, and they have promised to initiate an investigation. But this news is very disturbing, especially at a time when we have so many people in the infirmary suffering from Sudden cases of schizophrenia and other psychological disorders. I hope there is no connection between those cases and these reports of missing personnel. This is the audio log of Director William Banks, dated October 5th, 2145. It has been brought to my attention by environmental services that the recent power grid changes have caused many non-critical systems to malfunction. The report explains that this is due to either intermittent power outages or lower than optimal voltage input. It also says that sufficient power distribution to all non-critical systems is becoming more difficult to maintain thanks to Dr. Vitruger and his so-called optimizations to the energy stores in and around the facility. I assured the director of ES that I would file a report with central authority over this. This is Paul Simon, Security Specialist in IT. Our network security has been breached several times over the last few days. 
Now, it looks like it may have been going on longer than that, but whoever did this really knew what they were doing. They covered the tracks really well. I just happened to notice some log anomalies, or it would still be going on. The intrusion came on an encrypted carrier signal from the Delta complex. They piggybacked the virus on one of the supercomputer requests and it peeled itself from the data stream once it was inside our firewall. Someone on the inside there has to be responsible. Unfortunately, due to security in that complex, I can only tell it came from within Delta. There's no way to identify which machine or even which lab it came from. Whoever was in our system had access to all personal data, including medical reports. My team will be monitoring the network closely in the next few days, looking for anything unusual. End of log. Audio log for Kyle Berger, research supervisor for the EPD project. Uh, the, uh, the elemental phase deconstructor is fully operational, and the research data we have gathered so far is very impressive. Unfortunately, we had a terrible accident last week. Research assistant Patterson was calibrating one of the quark emitters in the chamber, and witnesses say he appeared to see something. It's almost like uh, something was talking to him, and uh, he backed right into the particle beam. It was not a pretty sight, as it took off the backside of his head. He lived a few minutes, although I'm not sure you could consider that living. But they say his eyes rolled back and forth, and he was trying to talk, although after losing that much brain matter, I'm sure it was just reflex actions. Anyway, due to this, I have enacted new safety protocols in the lab, and we have stocked one of the storage cabinets with emergency medical supplies. The code for the cabinet is 752. End of log. Audio log for Jack Smith, a benefits analyst in HR 1024-2145. I just went through another batch of accident reports from the science team. We've had five more people hurt this week while working with the equipment. The most serious incident was one John Hughes, whose hand was caught in one of the plastic extrusion systems. He was performing maintenance on it and states that he unplugged it and had the safety key in his pocket. It managed to activate without an apparent power source and uh, shredded his arm up to the elbow before someone got him out. <laughs> It's been reported that the uh, machine is still running and we can't shut it down. The cost on that incident alone is enough to raise the red flag, but this is just one in a pile. Uh, we're going to overrun our budget on benefits payout this quarter. And while it's not my department, I have to assume that the new equipment budget is going to be blown out as well because, uh, according to these reports, the equipment's breaking down on a daily basis. Please mark this for review at corporate. End of log. Audio report regarding the disrespectful treatment of new research staff, September 14th, 2145. As you know, I have gone to considerable effort to recruit my staff researchers for Alpha Labs. Finding team members with the qualifications, let alone the willingness to come to Mars, has not been a trivial task. You know this already. But it is necessary that I emphasize why their complaints must be taken seriously. We won't be able to keep our people or recruit new researchers if the harassment continues. No, harassment is exactly the right word. I'm routinely getting reports of UAC security asking inappropriate questions and submitting my staff to unnecessary background checks. I must insist that we be allowed to keep our personal lives private and be left to complete our assignments without further delays. If there is some kind of security threat, I suggest that UAC security look more deeply into their own staff. This is Andrew Chin, N. Audio log for Walter Connors. The MFS compressor is producing fantastic results. The latest modification I made to the dilation matrix were the real key to the recent breakthrough. All in all, I feel my work on this project has been the catalyst that propelled everything forward. I've also taken a set amount of time each day to make sure that everyone is doing their job, and of course I check all of their data to ensure that no mistakes are made. This is going to be a huge moneymaker for the company, and quite honestly, without my input and hard work, I am not sure that we would have gotten this far. But I wanted also to thank you for your supervisory role in the project. Working with you is a true honor. Just remember me in the end of the year reports, as I'm certain I deserve a promotion. Uh, Walter out. This is Operations Coordinator Mark Lamia. 
dated November 1st, 2145. I am filing this report because I am frustrated beyond belief by the level of incompetency I have to deal with here. I don't know where HR is getting the new employees, but the last five guys they've sent me were all a bunch of idiots. They can't get any of their work done on time. I constantly have to keep an eye on them. They work slow. They don't follow any of the standard operating procedures, and they can't even remember basic things that I tell them. For example, I changed the cabinet door codes here to 123 because I thought that was easy enough to remember, but they still forgot it. I don't understand why HR can't get me better people. I am requesting full authority to hire and fire my own employees. It's the only way I can run my department smoothly. End of log. Security log number 3072 for Delta Security Chief Michael Abrams, November 15th, 2145. I've just come from the armament division where I was issued one of the new BFG 9000 series weapons. <laughs> well, they weren't kidding about how much lighter it is over previous prototype models. Won't be so bad carrying this one around. <laughs> Anyhow, for a couple of weeks now, many of the security teams have not been following proper reporting procedures. Not sure if it's the format of the new SIR, so... I'll make sure each team is scheduled by training division to get spun up on the new reports. There have been some security issues in the Alpha Labs. I sent a team over to investigate, and now I can't reach them on any comm channel. Guess I'll have to go over there myself. Well, I'm headed over there now. I'll finish the security report in full when I get back. Oh yeah, one more thing. I'm gonna leave this BFG locked in my office for now. Please have IT security change my door code to 901. Sure as hell don't need anyone messing around with it. Chief Abrams, end of law. This is the audio log of plant manager Henry Nelson, dated October 24th, 2145. I don't know how I should report this, so I'll just talk about what I know and what I need. I've had quite a few employees reporting to me that they've heard strange sounds, like voices talking to them, calling them, even when they were alone. At first, I didn't believe them. The guys down here like to kid around, but they assured me they were serious. I ignored the stories at first, until one day, I heard something too. I was working on one of the lift-up service panels, and I distinctly heard the voice of someone saying, Over here. I quickly turned to see who was there, but the passage was completely empty. I looked around, but I didn't see another soul. I even checked the work logs, and no one else was working near that area. I don't want to sound crazy here, but my guys and myself are a little spooked, and some of the guys were even talking about ghosts. So, to make everyone, including myself, feel a little more comfortable, I'd like to request that a security team make a thorough check of the EFR area. Thank you. Henry Nelson. Paul Rad, Chief Technical Officer for the NPRO facility. During my weekly inspection of the coolant system, I discovered yet another safety violation. As I've stated repeatedly, our service manuals must be followed to the letter. Now, this includes changing back filters for the coolant system on schedule and not when maintenance gets around to it. As you know, unclean back filters will create pressure inside the coolant system's release tubes. Even a minor disruption in a release tube can dislodge or destroy its coolant rod, overheating the core, and possibly sending the entire facility up in smoke. Now let me be clear, if I see this again, the team responsible will be transferred to sewage treatment before the day is over. Paul Rad, Chief Technical Officer for the NPRO facility. I appreciate UAC's concerns following the number of stress-related illnesses spreading throughout the base. However, I don't understand why we require such a large detail of armed security bots in NPRO. Now, you may disagree, but I trust my team's mental condition far more than whatever programming is running inside those bots. Which brings me to the reason for this report. Today, one of my best engineers, Patrick Thomas, was nearly shot when a bot refused his clearance. That's right, shot. Luckily, a nearby team from maintenance caught up to it and smashed it with a pipe wrench before it could chase Pat down. Now, it'll be days before he's ready to return to work, and I don't think you'll ever get him close to one of those bots again. Our jobs are difficult enough without needing to avoid getting shot. If we're going to be treated like prisoners, I respectfully request that you afford us the courtesy of being guarded by people. 
instead of machine. This is the audio log of weapon analyst Teresa Chazar, dated November 3rd, 2145. I'm pleased to report that the preliminary tests on the ammo storage in the new Mach 3 plasma gun has far exceeded our expectations. We realized a full 50% gain in the storage capacity of ammo packs as a result of utilizing techniques engineered in the Alpha Lab's molecular compactor. I believe with the ongoing compaction research, we will reach our goal of three times the plasma storage currently available in standard ammo packs. I would also like to mention that all of the employees here at the NPRO plant have been very helpful and quite eager to accommodate all of my requests. For security reasons, I've locked the plasma gun and the extra ammo in locker 063 with door code 972. End of lock. Steve Hammer, service technician. Since Private Swenson wigged out, shot up that drink machine, then lit himself up with a plasma gun, we've all been a bit nervous. All of us in maintenance knew he was losing it. Finally, when that darn drink machine wouldn't accept his credits, he lost it. Started swearing up and down, and you had to laugh when that machine lit up. But before any of us could react, he fed himself enough plasma to power an office building. There wasn't enough head to clean up. Just vapor. It's a bad thing to happen to anyone. Anyway, I know with all the psych problems we've had lately, we need the additional security. But when the guards start going nuts, I don't know, all this extra weapons and ammunition. I mean, do we really need so much firepower laying around? Well, a couple of us decided to lock up all of the unsecured plasma rounds we could find. The code is 734. I think we'll all sleep a bit better tonight knowing it's locked up. This is the audio log of Controller James Holiday, dated September 24th, 2145. The recent transport issues from Site 3 have caused the board to call a formal inquiry. We'll study weight limits and suggest better ways to provide protection for Site 3 artifacts. Our equipment... Damn it, these PAs, does anything work with Finish this later. This is the audio log of Officer Ron Ridge, dated October 16, 2145. Recent transport tunnel accidents are causing major headaches for both supply and maintenance. Each accident causes an estimated one to three hour delay in what are mostly time sensitive shipments. It's becoming evident that certain junctions need safety adjustments as well as recommitment to driving safety by all personnel. The MPRO to Com Center route has shown the biggest increase in accidents over the past six months. Safety signs and approved lighting are needed throughout the main junctions over the stretch of tunnels and paths. Absolutely, no recreational vehicle passage should be allowed during peak hours. All personnel should use monorail travel whenever possible to keep cargo shipments flowing smoothly. This is the audio log of technician Seamus, dated October 16th, 2145. Our relatively new remote module replacement procedures are taking some time for maintenance technicians to adjust to. In the long run, it's a much safer, quicker, and easier method. Once a technician receives a call, he simply locates the problem module and gives a replacement command through the remote terminal located in the main comm block. This will initiate the replacement procedure as well as create a repair report, which notifies the repair team of an incoming module. Some minor repairs can be done on-site with normal equipment. I'm hoping the new system will need less and less use once the source of the recent power fluctuations is located and solved. The system is built to handle most other things with its automated recovery systems. This is the uh, audio log of Officer Ben Wolf, dated October 7th, 2145. <clears throat> recent uh, unauthorized transmissions have been uncovered in the off-site redundant logs. These logs are usually not validated, but uh, an unscheduled audit has shown significant activity. More investigating will be done to get to the bottom of this matter. Particularly interesting are transmission blocks D4560 and uh, DE3288, which have no links to base systems. More to follow. This is the audio log of Nicholas Edgeway, member of UAC Mars Hazmat Response Team, 
dated October 1st, 2145. We have concluded that the Martian atmosphere is wreaking havoc on the exhaust valve seals in the standard number 5 disposal drums. The engineers cannot explain the high level of contaminants in our internal atmosphere. The air scrubbers and filtration systems all seem to be operating at normal levels, yet a small layer of particulate is making it into the storage areas. That is what caused the lockdown yesterday. EAP Director Charles Hollis informs me that the personnel won't be harmed by these contaminants in the air, but we've seen that they do cause a corrosive reaction when introduced to the rubber compounds used in the storage systems. Effective immediately, all number 5 disposal drums must be locked away in at least a class 2 rated transport medium. Assessment ends. This is the audio log of engineer Sam Harding, dated April 5th, 2145. I have just completed repairs on the magnetic locks and have significantly reprogrammed the pressure sensors on the monorail systems. My fellow engineers and I are confident that the accident of last week will never happen again. The accident should never have happened in the first place. The internal sensors led the computers to believe that there was a vacuum inside the vehicle. Unfortunately, the computer decided that the only way to fix this pressure discrepancy was to open all doors in an attempt to equalize pressure with the outside. And going over 15,000 lines of code today, I can see no reason for this tragic event to have occurred. But somehow, the logs show the discrepancy is clear as day. Honestly, this looks to me like another case of a solid system going to hell in a handbasket. I'm confident that the layers of protection I added to the code today will prevent any such occurrences from happening again. I'm off to meet engineer Jim Torben at the access doors to the Delta Complex platform to try and troubleshoot a faulty track sensor that's been causing the door to stick. This is the audio log of Charles Hollis, EAP director, dated September 5th, 2145. In order to conserve current life support resources, effective October 1st, 2145, the Council has made a decision that all environment processors be brought offline in the general area of Site 2. Tomorrow, I will be sending out emails to all team leaders asking for an update on their asset relocation program to Site 3. We feel that we have unearthed enough useful material as it pertains to the project from Site 2, and choose to now devote resources in the exploration of Site 3. End log recording. This is the audio log of Robert Price, Delta Operational Director in charge of personnel, recruitment, evaluation, and placement. Emergency. Assignment of engineers to the lower Delta labs has become almost impossible. In six months, we've gone from a volunteer surplus to a critical deficiency of qualified personnel willing to accept assignment. Increases in both pay and benefits have done little to help this situation. Through exit interviews as well as the weekly Delta medical brief, it's become apparent to everyone that the rate of sudden and unexplained mental illness is way beyond acceptable levels, even for Mars. They're derogatorily being called sub-delts up here, and I have a feeling this attitude will spread to other parts of the UAC. End of log. This is the audio log of Robert Price, Delta Operational Director in charge of personnel, recruitment, evaluation, and placement. Disciplinary Action Report 40C-8, responding to Mars City Administration request. Delta Labs 1 is currently addressing a problem concerning theft of security equipment. Four members of the security detail assigned to the Delta Labs have been reprimanded with three others under investigation. It seems caches of weapons, armor, and ammo have been discovered in various places throughout the Delta Labs. We've located some of the missing equipment and have information that we hope will lead us to more. I have a team investigating storage room 21D with security code 298, where I've learned stolen items may be located. I hope to recover all items and find all personnel responsible. End of law. This is the audio log of medical supervisor Peter Raleigh, dated October 29th, 2145. We have exhausted all known forms of drug treatment in hopes of finding a way to abate this strange outbreak of dementia, and I have yet to receive any additional data from the psychiatrists back on Earth. 
options are quickly dwindling. Approximately 80% of all extraplanar participants exhibit signs of mild neuroses within the first 48 hours after returning from their expeditions. Within 72 hours, 75% of patients exhibit extreme signs of paranoid delusion and violence. We have isolated these cases in hopes of finding the pathogen. As yet, we can find no biological contaminants that would lead to such drastic changes in cognitive processing. It seems that whatever this pathogen is, it attacks higher brain functions and only leaves more basal functions in the lower brain stem. We've witnessed that a high percentage of subjects lose ability for rational thought and communication skills, and then the physical changes become evident. Subjects in this group appear to atrophy. Skin pales, muscles become slack, bone, teeth and fingernails become almost translucent, veiny sinews of their former selves. I have never seen anything like this in my career. Our observations continue. This is the audio log of medical supervisor Peter Raleigh, dated November 1st, 2145. Patient 0432, a private Steve Jensen of the UAC Darklight Armor Corps Division, expired today at 1543 of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. This is approximately 110 hours after his return from expeditionary missions. Private Jensen was suffering from paranoid delusions and full-blown dementia. Treatment was unsuccessful. He was the last surviving member of his outfit. Four other squad mates, who also came back with Private Jensen, expired from injuries suffered on that last mission shortly after their return. Before his death, Private Jensen was heard screaming in both English and other languages, something about demon hordes feasting on our souls. The other language was later discovered to be Aramaic. Due to security concerns in the area, I've secured some armaments within my office. As requested, the following is my initial feedback on my first trip through the portal. Private First Class Frank Cinder stated October 15th, 2145. I, uh, hmm. I don't know exactly where to begin. Obviously, I survived the first trip and feel no worse for the wear. I, I, I'm not feeling any of the symptoms reported by the others who have gone in before me, but I'm at a point where I'm still trying to process everything. Thankfully, the place looks deserted and devoid of any life, but uh, the flames and heat and stench of the place, it, it smells of death, decay, and burnt flesh. Tomorrow we're going back in with some of the eggheads, um, science division, to start securing forward positions and we expect to start sending out the mapping droids at the same time. I feel I must admit on a personal note that I, I've, I've got a really, really bad feeling about this. I don't understand what we're doing there or, or, or what we hope to prove. PFC Cinders, signing off. Audio log for Phil Wilson, medical technician, Delta Labs, October 20th, 2145. Uh, today I witnessed the third test of the teleporter in the three weeks that I've been here. Volunteers are becoming harder and harder to come by, and it isn't difficult to see why. They all come back screaming like loons about demons, pools of blood. I mean, you know, it's real fire and brimstone stuff. At first I wasn't paying much attention, just doing my job, but... The last was Robert Clayton. Now, I met him my first day here. This guy chews up rocks and spits out gravel. He's tough as they come. Having to sedate him and drag his drooling body to the isolation room, it's really freaked me out. I'm going to put in for a transfer as soon as I'm able. Uh, this is the audio log of research director Larry Bullman, October 19th. 2145. I've been examining the glyphs on the cube-shaped artifact, which some are calling the Soul Cube, and combined with previous research data, it is my conclusion the device is some sort of weapon. Uh, if the power fluctuations would stop long enough for me to get the linguistic CPU online, then I am sure my theory would be verified. 
you know, I'll take this opportunity to lodge yet another complaint about the continual power problems. Living in this godforsaken base is bad enough without having to watch the lights flicker constantly. It's just... Well, never mind. Back to the task at hand. What I've deciphered so far is a bit, I must say, disturbing. It seems that when one has possession of the artifact, if one inflicts damage or possibly kills another being, it extracts power from that event somehow. Now, once a certain threshold has been reached, the artifact has the ability to kill anything you attack with it. How you attack with it, I'm frankly not certain, indicating that the artifact is autonomous in some way. To date, I've only deciphered about, mm, two-thirds, give or take, of the markings, but my initial glance at the rest of them indicates it harbors some far greater power. As you know, at this time we have not seen any reaction from the cube, and it has withstood any scanning, abrasion, or other test beyond picking it up and examining it. I suspect that just like the civilization that constructed it, its capabilities are diminished to the point of being useful only as a paperweight. End of log. This is the personal audio log of Dr. Frank Serrano, dated September 19th, 2145. I've been brainstorming on Petruger's thoughts about achieving sustained, uninterrupted transfers for the teleportation units. Currently, our systems can only build enough of a charge to have the portals open for approximately 10 to 15 seconds. It's enough time to get a team through, but not enough time to send in some of the heavier equipment. Engineering in the Inpro facility informed me that we can theoretically boost the active portal time to 45 seconds quite easily. But, this will require rerouting power from central processing, and we just can't afford the downtime. The power requirements for this system are astronomical. We're sucking power from three veins in Inpro just to power chamber one. I have no idea how we can sustain transfers for longer than 60 seconds without giving serious thought to reorganizing the teleport power grid. I'll sleep on this. This is Dr. Frank Serrano signing off. This is the audio log of Administrative Assistant Han Lee, dated October 16, 2145. Why is it that I keep getting the crummy jobs? Armor Corps 1st Platoon and 1st Science Team were completely wiped out this morning on their second excursion. And I am the one charged with writing up the reports and sending this information back to Earth next of kin. <sighs> so here I am. First cup of coffee for the day. Five hours of sleep the night before. No shower. And I have 20 dead bodies to fill out paperwork on. I haven't seen the actual corpses, but... Word coming down from the grapevine says that it looks like they have been hacked up pretty good. This says everyone on the base spooked. Petruger is nowhere to be found, and there are a lot of questions being asked with no answers from anyone. Last I heard, they were suiting up the next outfit with the new BFGs. Sounds like they weren't taking any chances on this next trip with them packing that kind of firepower. This is the audio log of Administrative Assistant Han Lee, dated October 20th, 2145. Well, just when I thought this job couldn't get much worse, it did. Delta scientists sent another group of researchers through the portal two days ago, and they failed to return at their scheduled time. Radio transmissions to the research party have gone unanswered. Even our LZ tracking systems can't find them. We fear that they are dead. Losing lives is one thing, but losing our proprietary technologies is another. The team was equipped with the newest BFG weaponry. We fear those guns may have fallen into the hands of those that killed them. We don't know who or what is behind that portal. But until we find out where our guns are, I'm suggesting we suspend operations to the portal. Thank you. End of log. This is the audio log of Dr. Martin Schultz, dated August 7, 2145. We need to amend the operating procedures to ensure that all target teleport markers are properly set and locked before engaging the systems. We had a tragic accident today in Chamber 1 that led to the death of Susan, one of our female chimps. She stepped onto the platform during the calibration phase, and an electrical short gauged the system and literally split her in two. Her torso appeared at the destination marker while her lower extremities remained in place on the source pad. I'm not sure how we've gone this long without this problem appearing sooner, but it seems like we've been having nothing but difficulties getting these systems to work. I don't know where Betruger finds the energy. 
He's been busy slaving away in the labs for 16 hours a day trying to debug these latest problems. What's he trying to do? Make the rest of us working stiffs look bad? <laughs> Regardless, we have our work cut out for us over the next couple of days, going over all the system's logs to see exactly what went wrong with this round of tests. Dr. Martin Schultz signing off, hoping to report better news next time. This is the audio log of research specialist Simon Garlick, dated August 8th, 2145. It seems that I have misplaced the rest of the science team. I don't know how it happened. This place... Well, I don't know what this place has done with them. One moment there, I'm taking samples, and the next thing I know, I, I, I turn around and everyone is gone. There, one second, turn around, and they're gone. I can't raise anyone on the comm links, and the only signs of the team I can find are tools and other personal effects that seem to have been left behind. Almost as if they had stopped working midway through running experiments. This place does funny things with your eyes and your perception of time. Um, hopefully, I just went into the next sector and are waiting for me to catch up. I am going off to find them now. This is Simon Garlic, signing off. This is the audio log of research specialist Simon Garlic, dated August 10th, 2145. It's been two days now since I've seen any other team members. I don't know how I've survived this long or how I got away. They were just, uh, torn apart. Um, uh, they could only be described as demons. I have never seen such a big thing move so quickly. Oh dear God, what has happened to us? The teeth. Oh, that's the last thing I remember seeing. Teeth. The sounds. Words cannot describe. I'm sure it's just a matter of time before they find me again. I'm convinced they are toying with me, allowing me to stay two steps ahead of them. I... I can see them in the shadows sometime. Uh, why do they taunt me? I'm not sure how much longer I, 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 I can... I'm shooting at shadows here. And every moment I feel them creeping closer toward me. Oh God. Oh God, we should never have... This is the audio log of Counselor Elliot Swan, dated November 15th, 2145. This entire research facility is in chaos. There's at least a 90% death rate among civilian personnel. Whatever Betruger unleashed is literally consuming the base. People have been turned into some sort of undead creatures that are relentless. Campbell and I are making our way towards the communications facility. We must stop all communications. If a distress call leaves the base, then everyone here and on Earth is doomed. This is the audio log of Counselor Elliot Swan, dated November 16, 2145. Campbell and I were unable to reach the main portal in the Delta Complex, but that portal may be inconsequential to a more disturbing discovery. We have uncovered reference to another portal, created by the demons themselves, a passageway between Hell and Mars. We suspect it resides within the cavern somewhere near the archaeological dig. The fleet is on its way. Campbell and I will attempt to move there and somehow either shut it down or destroy it. That... that... hellhole must be closed before the fleet arrives. This is the audio log for Tony Bates, Mars Security IT Division, September 25th, 2145. I spent the last four hours going through the code for the door systems here in Central Processing. And this is proving to be a real bitch of a glitch to work out. I've traced through every system I can think of, and access to Lab A continues to be problematic for the time being. All the regular access codes seem to be working fine, but the database will not allow access rights to be granted to new visitors. In the meantime, I'm adding a backdoor code into the systems for IT staff and the eggheads, so if they need access to Lab A while the systems are on the fritz, they can use the code 627 to bypass door security. End of log. This is the audio log for Tony Bates, Mars Security IT Division, October 15th, 2145. 
I resume my investigation into case A-10982, the systems intrusion that took place in the CPU complex yesterday. All network traces seem to originate from an old system located in Site 2, Office S2-038. What is truly troubling is that engineering informs me electrical systems have been offline in that section for years and were only reactivated this morning in order to prepare more storage space. I'm completely stumped on this one. How does a hack originate from a section of the base that has been out of commission for so long? I will make another report once I have personally investigated the suspect office in Site 2. End of log. This is the audio log of Charlie Haskell, Delta Labs technician, dated September 23, 2145. We're making good progress in increasing the max range of Chamber 3 in the Delta Complex. We've been crunching numbers all night and feel that with a few slight modifications, we should be able to boost output to cover all of Delta. The latest schedule changes are wreaking havoc on our current systems, and it's not uncommon to see system utilization at 99% for days at a time. We understand that Lab A has finally received the NREC 6809 systems. Please consider this a formal request for a block of two hours to run our latest formulas at the soonest available time. This is the scientific journal of Dr. Richard Davis, dated August 8, 2145. We've just broken through to a new chamber, and I think I've found the map alluded to on one of the tablets. The artifact is constructed into the ceiling, and it is a magnificent find. It appears to be made of some crystalline material, and even after all this time, it is still emitting a soft glow. The markings on it were strangely familiar when I first observed it, and after digitizing it and analyzing it, I'm certain this is a map of our solar system. It seems to show a connection between Mars and Earth. My current working theory is that the last survivors used the teleportation technology to escape to Earth. The ramifications of this are overwhelming. This may end up proving that we are actually descendants of this race, and what we are exploring is our own history. I'm going to report my findings as soon as we finish the excavation, and they should show up in corporate within a few days. These are truly exciting times. Log out. This is the audio log of Dr. Pierce Rogers. I don't know if I'll make it off the base alive. I don't have much time, so I'll sum up what I have quickly and upload the rest of my finding into the data bank. I hope someone finds them. It was all on the stone tablets, all the answers. I can't believe we never saw it. It was as plain as day. If we had only slowed down the development of the teleporters and tried to really learn what the tablets were trying to tell us, trying to warn us. The ancient people battled the same demons that are attacking us now. The demons came through the teleporters that they built, just like now. They created the Soul Cube and used it to stop the demons, to drive them back to hell. I don't know how, but that must be the answer. That is why that artifact was left behind, left for someone to find if something like that ever happens again. I can't reach Delta from here. I won't make it. I truly hope and pray someone finds the Soul Cube. And it helps. Lord, help us. End of log. Audio report regarding dangerous working conditions in caverns below Delta. This is Bob Cody. Today is October 18th, 2145. My crew has been rewiring the generators as ordered for the last several days. We can't finish the work. We're stopping after today. This job ain't worth dying for. We'll be collecting our gear and tying down what we can. We call them howls because that's how they start. First the howling gets louder, the screaming, then shaking earth, uh, Mars quakes, throws everything around. Makes walking on the catwalks impossible and working with voltage. Stupid. The noise is if some of the guys spoke, and I don't blame them. Nothing natural about what we've heard. If someone can figure out what's causing the howlers, I'll get the crew to finish the job. Till then, we'll be available for a new assignment tomorrow. <laughs>